Hello and welcome to Who's On Next, the podcast where I don't need an opener every week, so stop asking me. Today I have with me a man known for being the creator of the Netflix show Glitch Tax, the show Greg the Bunny, and is also a writer on projects such as Robot Chicken. It is Dan Milano. Hi, how are you? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, I'm always eager to talk and there's just been, you know, lockdown is so lonely. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want to connect. I need I, I need communication. Yeah. Need is someone to... there? Are there people there? <laughs> Alive inside. <laughs> Locked in my house like the hermit that I am. <laughs> yeah, we myself. finished production last year and in a way I'm so grateful that it was a clean break for all this, you know, and so I've just been able to concentrate on, you know, my family and I have a daughter, so we're doing homeschooling and then I've been able to interact a lot online and everything and it's been, you know, it's been kind of cool actually to to have that time to, to reach out. Um, but yeah, we're going stir crazy, so we're also like half mad from all this insanity. <laughs> Oh yeah, everybody. Everybody's going insane. I think that's. I've had this conversation. I think with nearly every person I've interviewed, it's just what what they've been doing the last four months, basically. Yeah. Or how how having to adjust to everything. There's been bursts of creativity, but lots of stretches with nothing because everyone's too kind of brain fried. <laughs> um, I'm a. I'm a. I love that Gary Witta did. Um, his animal talking show because I thought that was really a clever, you know, answer to being stuck in lockdown, just like hopping on animal crossing and <laughs> communicating <laughs> with people that way is pretty genius. Um, you know, so here and there, there've been these flashes of inspiration, which is really cool to see. Yeah. Right. So, uh, I guess I'll just get into it. So I guess in the grand scheme, because you've had a very diverse career, what, what is it that got you started in entertainment as a whole, I guess? I was pretty obsessed as a child with um, drawing at first and like I would write phonetically and my mom was would always encourage me to like sound out my words and, and tell little stories and I was a big fan of um, Sesame Street where I was learning a lot about writing and, and creativity but also um, you know, I became obsessed with the Muppets themselves and the Muppet Show, which was like the primetime uh, version of Sesame Street. It wasn't educational. It was like right, yeah. this really fun variety show. And that fascinated me. And my parents, um, they bought me a book. They're, I'm sure you can find it on eBay. It's this great coffee table book called Of Muppets and Men, The Making of yeah. the Muppet Show. And there was also a TV special that went with it that I'm sure is on YouTube. Yeah, that, that book is... Um... I actually spoke to Matt Vogel, the guy who currently does Kermit. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, and he that book is that book's been out of print for like forty years. It's a very very pricey book. I want to read it, but oh man, you have to show it like two hundred bucks. <laughs> oh that man, book. that's a shame. I hope yeah. I hope somebody would reprint it. It's gorgeous and uh, amazing. And I was only about eight years old when I got it. I still have the copy, and. Um, it's yours for two hundred dollars now. Uh, I would never, I would never part with it. I love it so much. It's next to me now on my bookshelf. Just I was flipping the pages and I realized that oh, the Muppet Show is made by you know people and they're puppeteers who you know breathe life into those characters. And I kind of immediately understood the relationship to the camera, um, which introduced like cinema into my life and. Um, what really amazed me is that my parents told me they were a little worried about showing me that book because they knew I really believed in the world of like the Muppets and they were afraid it would, saw, they were afraid it would ruin the magic. Basically. Yeah. Would I be freaked out to see, you know, people with their arms up these characters that I loved. <laughs> but uh, what really struck me was that it made sense that they were controlled by somebody. Um, but I, my belief in them did not, change and I was able to kind of simultaneously accept the two realities and I think that kids who can do that if they become fascinated with the reality of the making of the show they probably will find their way into some field of like entertainment or engineering or or what have you because I 
also did get to grow up in the video generation. Like I got a video camera when I was 12 and that was like a really new thing to have commercial um, video cameras in the hands of uh, consumers and really early um, video editing software for personal computers, which started to come up when I was in college. Um, and yeah, I just became fascinated. So anything I could do to tell a story with drawings or video or just audio, you know, like just recording voices and making little skits and things, I was pretty uh, astounded with. So I, looking back, I was just this like creative little ADHD kid who just <laughs> would never be quiet. <laughs> and, you know, sounds I just... Sounds a lot like me. <laughs> yeah. a lot like me. So many of the people I know and have grown up with and so many people seemingly in the audiences that... Um, I talk to in, in social media communities online. I think we all kind of share um, that obsession with these things and and we're all like somewhere probably on this spectrum. I don't think I've ever met anyone in the industry who wasn't somewhere, didn't have a beautiful mind of some sort. <laughs> um, and so anyway, that that's really it. I just became fascinated and it's always been a part of my life. So I was always drawing uh, books I, I was always writing in in my notebooks at school. Very often I was writing little scripts for my friends and I to make videos from, or I would um, write sequels to movies that I liked. You know, I <laughs> usually wouldn't finish them, but I would write like the first act or I'd write scenes, you know, um, anything but like sit still for my, my studies in my class <laughs> that I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. Just had a really hard time, you know, focusing. So I would hyper focus in my notebook. Right, and one yeah. thing led to another. I, I, my parents saw that I just had this aptitude, and they recognized that, and they supported me in finding, you know, friends and going to um, educational programs, which I was lucky to have. But I think today, people don't even really need that. I think that what's important in my opinion, about going to like a film school or a program or a club is really just access to other people. I don't right, think, yeah. you know, you can teach the fundamentals at any age, but what you really want is just people to nerd out with and to actively create with. And, oh, yeah. and you don't have to pay an institution for that. So, you know, my parents got kind of ripped off in that deal, but I appreciated that I had the privilege that they were able to support me in going to school uh, at NYU undergrad, where I, I met a lot of the people that um, kind of jump started me into making projects. Now, again, because you brought up the Muppets, and again, Greg the Bunny was one of the first major projects you did. Just, I guess, you headed. And... Yeah, I mean, I had puppets on my brain a lot. Right, yeah. Now, was was puppeteering always the main thing you wanted to do, like with Greg the Bunny, or was it... Like, was that just like a, a coincidence that that was one of the first things you did? I was almost derailed from pr puppetry because up to a certain age, I was really into it. And then I remember telling my grandmother, who's really sweet, this will sound like she's mean, but <laughs> it was more, she was more ignorant, I think, than, than mean. But I told her, oh, I want to grow up and work with Jim Hun Henson and I want to be a Muppeteer. And she was like, oh, that is so silly. I, I, I don't think you can really do that because oh. she came from a time where that was not practical at all. And she wasn't like shutting me down, like, you'll never do it. She just genuinely was like, oh, that doesn't exist, sweetie. And I remember thinking, oh, well, eh, all right, I'll do something else. But then if I ever get the chance, I'll do that. Like, it, I, I didn't even, I wasn't even insulted. So for a while, coupled with being in high school and like, totally insecure about everything, I also wasn't running around being like, hey, everybody, look at me. I brought my puppets. So, yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> So I kind of just put it aside. But when I was in college and my friends and I were making videos, I got my hands on a puppet at one point and started goofing around and improving some characters. And my friends were like, oh my God, that's hilarious. Let's make a video where we have a puppet. And so it kind of brought it back, you know, brought back my passion for it. And it also gave my friends something they wanted to use. So they would do projects involving puppets and ask me to be the puppeteer. And eventually, we just sort of decided to make a public access show um, in New York called Junk Tape, which was the first use of the Greg the Bunny character. And, you know, 
the friends we had made in New York City at the time, some of them had gone off to work at the Independent Film Channel, which had just started mm. um, as a company, and they were looking for interstitial short films for their network. And they saw Greg the Bunny, and um, we even had an agent see the show and call us from the number on our screen when they saw an episode of the show because they thought it was well produced. And so we, we got a lot of attention, and that led to doing um, short pieces for IFC. And ironically, IFC was not available in New York. You could only see it on cable packages in mm -hmm. LA. So everyone in LA, including like the Henson Company, um, Stan Winston, um, Laura Ziskin and Lauren Schuler Donner, who were producers in, at Sony Pictures, like they were all watching IFC and seeing Greg. So eventually, we found out, my friends and I, that um, people in LA really like your your <laughs> short films and they want to meet you. So we kind of went to LA and we met all these wonderful people who we eventually worked with. Um, and one of them actually had a deal at Fox to develop a new series and we just thought it was a practical joke. We didn't think there was any way you could go from public access to like a Fox primetime series. Right. Yeah. The economy was doing really well and they, people were getting insane deals. So Steve Levitan ended up producing 13 episodes of Greg the Bunny for Fox. And that was a crash course for me in, you know, producing. And because I did the puppet, suddenly I was actually in the cast and I was playing opposite Sarah Silverman and Eugene Levy and Seth Green, who all became friends. And it was just this express elevator to the industry. And suddenly, you know, people are saying, oh, do you have other scripts? And do you like to write? And do you want to do this? Or do you want to do that? Um, Seth started making Robot Chicken, which at the time was a series of shorts for Sony, a Sony website right? Yeah, uh, called Sweet J. And uh, yeah, because if you, so everything just kind of happened. If you watch like the early Robot Chicken shorts, I think they even still have the Sweet J like name on them. Like yeah, the, uh, the early episodes, at least season one, because I think season one was actually a compilation of a lot of the Sweet J stuff. Yes, that's right. Some of it, or it was re the sketches redone. They just would reanimate those sketches, but now under the the new studio and everything that they had built. Because I remember being in dressing rooms at Greg the Bunny. And all of us gathering around the TV to watch, you know, Seth's Sweet J shorts and loving them. And then, you know, I remember playing ping pong with Seth, who would always order Chinese food and always order robot chicken. And he was like, we're thinking maybe the show should be called Junk in the Trunk. But I, I just think like something really ridiculous would be fun, like robot chicken or whatever. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. And then the next thing I know, that's what they called the show. Yeah. Um, but it was a great time. It was just, again, it's like people who know and like each other all being creative at the same time. And what changed is as I got older, some people had enough connections that there were, you know, chances and opportunities to actually make content. Um, but I always tell people who are starting out that you don't really get into the business and you don't kind of like wait for somebody to come and approve you to be a creator or a writer or an actor you just kind of do it you just do it your whole life and eventually when you're around other people who do it the the opportunities really do come in some form or another um you know it's just you you just one day kind of find yourself adjacent to and then involved with you know people who are involved um and, and opportunities that come so that's really all we did i mean seth included he he was just a kid who used to open his big mouth whenever he'd go to toy conventions and he would like stand on a box and tell everybody about mask toys. And somebody was like, Hey kid, you're really charming. Have you ever done a commercial? And he just became an actor. Yeah. You know, you know, the people who really can't help themselves, I think have the best shot at kind of, you know, one way or another creating a path to the industry. Right. Yeah. Cause I remember him talking about, um, I think on Conan, how he was on like Johnny Carson when he was like 15, just talking about yeah. toys. And that's it. It was, I think he was just, I don't even know if he was a TV actor at that point yet. I think he was just doing commercials. Yeah, he was just obsessed with what he loved and somebody noticed. And, you know, he wasn't from LA. He, he did local stuff first. And, um, 
you know, eventually, uh, you know, a little a bit of opportunity and a little bit of luck, you know, it all kind of can come together. Uh, and now there are so many other ways, too, that you can, you know, submit yourself to uh, to people, you know, online and there are fellowships and there are contests and there are ways to, like, get a little bit of attention. But um, Greg the Bunny was not meant to be like anti Henson, it was actually a very loving, you know, tribute to the Muppet Show. I was so, and I'm still amazed by the work of Jim Henson and Frank Oz and their peers. Um, I don't think anyone can live up to them. And I think everyone knows that, including Matt Vogel, who I've worked with and loved, and he does an amazing job. And he'll be the first to say, hey, I'm not Jim Henson, nor should he be. He can just be Matt and Matt's version of Kermit, which is fair. But, um, those guys had a magic that is truly incredible. They were such amazing actors, and we tried to emulate them as much as we could. And the show just tried to kind of say, well, what what if these puppets were real? You know, how would they fit into society? Um, and the message was always a little watered down, but we did our best. You know, we it was a very strange show to, to for everyone involved. And... Um, we just had the most fun we could with the opportunity we were given. And we've done a few versions of it over the years for a right. couple different networks. Right. Yeah. And cause you were both Warren and Greg. Yes. And <laughs> so was, was that always the case? Like, were you going to play both of them or cause I figured you were going to play Greg cause that was your established character, but was Warren the same thing or was that just a case of, yeah, you know, when we were on Independent Film Channel, I was everybody because we didn't know any other puppeteers, and I would literally perform with two hands. So, when you see Greg and Warren in a shot in a lot of those old videos, it'd be like, "Hi there, Warren. How are you?" I'm fine, Greg. What's going on? Eh, nothing. I just been knocking around the apartment. <laughs> oh well, I noticed that uh, you you didn't leave the toilet seat down. But what's up with that? Well, um, you know, I just didn't think that you would need me to do that, and I would just go back and forth <laughs> and my head would hurt so bad from it but I could pull it off and um, I also started to do Count Blah on the original show I was right, the Count yeah. Blah who says Blah every two seconds and the Wumpish who was a very furry and weird character and then when we went to Fox it was like Dan can't do all of this it's insane and I didn't right, yeah. want to do it all I, wa I was like please I want to work with puppeteers i want to know people who have worked with henson and who know henson and so um i did i was attached as warren because warren and greg were both very unique characters and they're two sides of my personality and you know my my friends involved in the show too they were like okay dan should do those and then we opened up count blah to drew massey who's an amazing puppeteer right, and yeah. creator and um then over the years we started creating new characters for puppeteers like Victor Yarrett and um, James Murray and they just ran with it and I learned so much from them about tandem puppetry and about you know um, so much about technique although they'll probably be the first to tell you like in some ways I was unteachable because I just did what I knew, my muscle memory knew how to do <laughs> whether it was right or wrong and everybody would just go with it which was also very nice um, you know but I, there were things I learned and other things that I just, my brain couldn't seem to adjust to after like, you know, I don't know, by then it was like 20 years of self-taught uh, right or wrong, you know, stuff I was doing. Right, yeah. Well, and you guys ended up getting, uh, Victor and Drew have been recurring on uh, Robot Chicken, if I remember correctly. Like they've been yeah. performers. Yeah, we've all done voices at one time or another, um, especially early on because you know, the show wasn't really popular yet and they didn't have a relationship with any like uh, voiceover agencies and they couldn't get actual celebrities. So, so many of us were doing the show in the first like two seasons. And then after that, it just took off like a rocket and they could get, they, we would do utility voices, but they would also just get the people they wanted most of the time. Right, yeah, because the thing I know, I think it was the same thing with, uh, I remember Drawn Together was... It was the case of, I think they were only able to get guests if it was like friends of friends or if it was friends yeah. of the creator or things like that, primarily. Yes. Uh, Bill Freiberger, who uh, ran Drawn Together and most recently he did Sonic Boom, he was um, one of the main writers on 
Greg the Bunny at Fox, and he was the head writer of War and the Ape, which we did for MTV. Um, and yeah, he just would, you know, beg, borrow, and steal, you know, favors from people he knew to get folks on that show. I didn't even know he worked on Draw Together. That kind of <laughs> brings my point weirdly full circle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I guess with everything we've been talking about, but I guess with um with moving on to Robot Chicken, because what what's the writing process for a show like that like? With a show that's so, I guess, I'm trying to even think of the right word, a show that's so, I guess, just wild and diverse with sketches and different characters. Like, what's the writing process for a show like that like? I think the diversity comes from the fact that they do mine a lot of fresh writers every year or two years, although the the main core of writers that have been there since the beginning is still very much around as well. Um, it's it's an odd process to be honest because those guys they didn't they didn't come up sort of admiring sketch comedy or wanting to emulate traditional writing. They were magazine editors and writers who were doing um, toy fair theater for like toy fair magazine and they were working at Wizard magazine as well. And Seth was a fan. They got to know each other um, through Seth contacting the magazine and talking about how much he loved it. And then they started making films together and they just kind of winged it, really. They put together a process that works for them and they continue to use it to this day. But it's a very non-traditional writing room. They, they basically, they do put a bunch of people in a room, but those people do not necessarily write together unless they want to. Like... I was there for a cycle with Rachel Bloom, who I really love, and we became good friends, and we always wanted to work together. We would just like partner up and go outside or take a walk and, and pitch our ideas to each other. But a lot of times people would just be kind of quiet and have their head down and come up with their sketch ideas. And at the end of the day, um, those ideas would be pitched and sort of approved or not approved by um, Seth and Matt and the head writer which was efficient, but also a little harsh in, in the sense that you had to have a thick skin because sometimes you just get a hard yes or no. And um, so it was odd, but I think it's like, it's good. It's a good place for some writers to build up their calluses. Uh, Sarah Silverman told me that SNL used to be a really difficult place as well, to say the least. Um, although I think that's gotten better over the years. Um, I have a friend in the cast now who really enjoys it. Um, but typically that, is actors and writers pairing up and sort of forming partnerships. So sketch shows can be very odd. I don't think there's one person who's the voice of the show, although there are one or two that kind of just have the the final yes or no on if something gets in. Um, and they've managed to st stay fresh and do a lot of different things. I think a lot of fans will probably point to different seasons as things that they like better than others, but on the whole, you know, there's just some really funny, wild, um, you know, takes on these classic characters and on nostalgia from the 80s and 90s. So, yeah, it's unique. I don't know how else to explain it. I can answer specific questions, but that's that's basically how it's structured. It's kind of like you just uh, you fill your your funny gun with ammo and you take your shots and then someone else kind of tells you if you're on target or not. Right. Yeah. And I guess with um. I mean, I do stand by, it's the the He-Man sketches on Robot Chicken are still, like, some of my favorite, like, just comedy sketches I think I've ever seen. In terms of parody, the He-Man stuff is fantastic on Robot Chicken. It's still, like, one of my favorite things every time they do something new with it. I'm fortunate that that's one of my favorite tones because they tend to be more character-based, and that's yeah, what I yeah. really like. They are usually slice of life of these, like, big toony heroes and villains who are put into really mundane situations which is just what like venture brothers is you know it's right, just yeah. really great or archer and it's just great character comedy and fortunately i um you know if they could have hired the original actor who performed skeletor they probably would have but because it was season <laughs> one it was me doing it and i did skeletor and we had so much fun so they've kept bringing me back over the years to do skeletor Mike Fasolo writes a lot of the Skeletor sketches uh, and Tom Root. Um, and so they would always like give me a call and say, hey, we're doing some Skeletor this year. You want to come in? 
um, but that's yeah. when the show is, is at its best, I think, when they're doing character comedy. I had always heard this. Uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but I always heard this rumor that like Peter Cullen was supposedly asked to come in to play Optimus for a season of Robot Chicken or something, and he like turned it down. I don't know if that's true, but I'd always it's heard that. It's probably true. I don't yeah. know that it was. I don't know if it was that clean cut. Like they were like, Mr. Cohen, would you please? And he was like, no, get away. I'm sure it was more, you know, these things happen through a lot of times, like through agents and through other people. But I'm sure they asked because there's no way they wouldn't want Peter Cohen, especially early on. Um, he was a hero to them. And, you know, he may have said no. For all I know, he's worked with them since, but maybe not. I don't know. Right. Yeah. Because, um, they usually would go after the actors first they because they really wanted the chance to meet and work with those people. So I right. think in almost every case they would try. Right, because I know Bill Ratner uh, from G.I. Joe has actually come in several times to do a lot of G.I. Joe stuff for them. Yeah, they after a while I think people realized that, you know, what it was and that like, oh, this is kind of a mostly loving um, tribute and people are enjoying it and people in their own families might be enjoying it that happens a lot when it's like it's easier to get george lucas if his kids love it and it's easier to get you know um you know uh, like a band to come in if they're watching it in their tour bus so as the show gets popular you just kind of start to have a little bit more outreach right yeah i'm it, sure they don't pay very much so to <laughs> somebody like colin too he's like i've never heard of this show it's gonna pay dirt and i have to drive to where and so i wouldn't blame him if he doesn't know he's just like meh pass you know <laughs> what's a robot chicken i don't know <laughs> well, i think it's the craziest as i say that because frank welker's been on a lot like the past like few years which i think is crazy they've had him do it which also tells me he has at least a very good sense of humor if he's if he's that's also so like that. important yeah it's it's also so many of these shows are like coming to hang out and play a little bit and so if you are a big kid who ha you know and i'm not saying peter cullen isn't i don't know him but there 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 are people that just immediately are down because they just love any chance to show up and do stuff and, and it's not so much about um anything else but that so i i'm I assure you that Frank Welker is just somebody who loves to hang out and play and, you know, mess around. But um, it's actually something I've been very curious about because I remember hearing about this a few years ago, and I don't know how much you'd actually be able to talk about this depending on where it is. Um, I remember seeing that you were penned for a short circuit remake, like a oh, yeah. movie. No, I can talk about that, yes. Okay, yeah. I didn't know how much you'd be able to talk about, if that's even still really in the works or not, because we haven't heard anything about it in a long time. For a while, I was becoming like a career screenwriter, and what that means is, you know, basically just a writer for hire who would come in and either... I had sold an original script or two to some studios, but mostly your original script is what lets a studio kind of see your style. Right. And then they ask you to work on some of the many licensed properties they all have and are trying to resuscitate. So um, I would take meetings on movies for like HR Puff and Stuff and mm -hmm. uh, adapt adaptations of comics, like from Image Comics, like Alistair Arcane or Hackslash and cool projects. And uh, I think I once did a Treasure Island pitch with Caleb Smith for, for Will Smith. Um, mm. And it's all, there are just, there used to be like hundreds and hundreds of projects going every year. And a career screenwriter can go anywhere from pitching to fully writing without ever seeing anything greenlit ever. That was a big revelation for me. I was like, wow. So to be a career writer in Hollywood means basically you you know, you have the fun of writing, you take the meetings, you get paid, but the shot is still like one in 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 a hundred that you're going to get a, a script produced <laughs> right? Yeah. because they're just making, they're taking that many shots and, and only choosing certain ones. So I had accepted that to a point and I was writing script after script. And then um, Short Circuit was one I was really passionate about though, because I really did love that original and I thought, well, it would be really cool to be very uh, pure to the original, but just try to kind of update it um, 
as a like a kind of a kid in robot story that wasn't too schmaltzy like it wasn't too like over emotional but it was definitely sweet it was definitely kind of a fairy tale and um right, yeah. It was really important to me to keep the character the same uh, of Johnny Five and to update him, but have him largely be who he was. To me, Johnny Five was like an actor they needed to pull out of retirement. I didn't want him heavily redesigned. I didn't want them to change the voice, um, but it was on me in the script to make sure that he would still be relevant because I knew if I didn't, that that's exactly what they were going to do. He would have been like, hello, little boy, I am Johnny Five, you know, or <laughs> some like slick ergonomic, in, you know, thing. And I was like, man, the original Johnny Five is still magic. So um, I worked with the original producer, David Foster, but the pitch was with um, not Bob Weinstein, but his brother, <laughs> um, mm. whose name I'm freaking blanking on, um, <laughs> weirdly enough. And we had a really good meeting. He really liked my pitch. And I went and I did a couple drafts and I got notes and I did a few more and I was really proud of it. And, and David really liked it. And, um, you know, what ends up happening is that if these things don't move fast enough, the rights to the actual property revert to different people. Oh, okay. So they couldn't get it going for whatever reason. They were all pretty down for it. We had two directors attached. Um, at different times and you can kind of google that and see who they had um but ultimately yeah it just o over time the license fell apart and to my knowledge they never even really went on to another script i don't think they have redeveloped it i think it's still sitting with whoever owns the original license it was at sony for a while but i don't know if it still is so yeah it just never happened but that mm -hmm. was a huge disappointment because i really thought that would go all the way and it's one of the reasons I kind of decided to go back into um, TV and that I was really interested in animation as well. Because live action is, you know, animation takes a very long time to create, but for some reason you can usually get a production going a lot more quickly than you can in live action. Probably just because of how much money uh, live action tends to cost. And um, so I started kind of staffing on animated shows while I was writing pilots for both live action and animation and eventually um, started to do more animated work. But yeah, Short Circuit was mostly a really good experience. I, I really enjoyed working on it and I'm super proud of the script. So so basically that movie is sat like, I guess it's been shelved technically or it's on like indefinite hiatus basically? Yeah, I mean, whoever owns it can ultimately choose to dust it off and make it and whether that or not they choose to use that script uh, which is pretty dated now a little I would say they'd have to dust it off and and improve it um, so they could either come back to me or more likely they would start fresh a lot of times once you do a few drafts of something they usually start fresh which I've learned not to take too personally mm. if anyone wants to be a screenwriter the industry is constantly changing now more than ever but if you want a basic understanding, there's a book by um, Tom Lennon and Ben uh, Grant, if I'm saying his name right. They are from um, the state and UCB. They created um, uh, Reno 911, uh, the, the TV series, and they also um, have written a ton of Hollywood films, including like Night at the Museum is one of their biggest. And they yeah. wrote an, a really funny like almost parody book of how to write in the movies, but everything they say is legitimate. So they'll be very funny. Like th there's a chapter that just tells you where all the in and out um, burger restaurants are in LA. <laughs> and there's another chapter that tells you, um, uh, it, it lists like how well your project is doing at a studio based on where your parking spot is. <laughs> But what I loved is that they're right. It was all true. I had been working long enough to know that everything they were saying was correct. And within that book, there's also some just fantastic advice about how to take meetings and what your expectations should be and how to how to um, make the most of notes, even if you don't agree with them. And just really great stuff that I was not taught in school or didn't hear in any of the other like podcasts or sources I was listening to. It's called um, how, to, how to Make Movies for Fun and Profit 
but they cross out fun on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like cynical, but at the same time, you can tell they really love what they do. And they're trying to give practical advice that if you want to write for Hollywood in the commercial industry, this is a survival guide that will get you jobs and keep you jobs and keep you a little bit mentally healthy and hopefully making some 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 money because it can be very profitable but i found it um also just maddening i i really wanted to create stuff to be seen and the amount of time and resources i was putting into features you know was not netting me any you know i got some nice paychecks out of it um and i don't live well i don't have a lot of money so i needed that money but i wasn't satisfied creatively so i was able at least to you know make make less but doing things that i loved more with more people too it's very lonely to write feature scripts i like to work in a room full of people so i like tv because you have like usually a room full of writers right yeah it reminds me uh you brought up that book it reminds me of um Bob Odenkirk and David Cross made a great book. I think it was literally just called No. <laughs> all it was was it's it's basically every rejected film script they've ever written compiled into a book, and it's fantastic. Genius. Like, yeah, because I think they basically said the whole thing was, well, no one's ever going to pick these movies up, so we're just going to take all these scripts and compile them into a book. Like I love it. Yeah. Yep. Oh, it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. It's so funny. It makes me I, really sad though that those can never be turned into films now because of I that. I see it here. Hollywood said no. Hollywood I am said buying no. It. That's what it was. I am buying it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I mean, everyone at this time is pretty contemporary, you know, um and all tasting the frustration of the business at the same time and you know, I've also learned I've done enough producing to know that it's this crazy D and D game, the industry where you're always trying to slay these big dragons. Where you're you're trying to go in armed with like an idea, and you know, for those who play RPGs, it's like when you get that like plus five sword, that might be oh, the producer is Will Smith, and they really want to work with Will. That gives me a plus five to slay this dragon, <laughs> and I've got the helm of. Um, you know, I've got the helm of um, good, good uh, reputation because my last project did so well that now I have like a, just for this turn, I have a bonus plus six. Um, but no matter what, it still comes down to kind of a random die roll of things that you can't control. There are so many projects with, with so much going on at once. And there are so many political and financial factors on a studio level that creatives can never even really understand or want to, that can always make or break a project. So it's very frustrating. It's like, it's a creative business, but it's also kind of a high stakes, you know, a gambling table. And you kind of have to be okay with that to some level to keep your sanity. Fortunately, we're seeing more and more independence coming in. And we're also seeing a humbling, I think, of Hollywood in the face of the economy and the amount of um, content and and distributors that we have now, uh, and and the role that video games play in entertainment, like I, I think the studios have had to really either be humbled or start to kind of reapproach how they do things. So it might be getting easier for some, but it's always kind of a, a rodeo out there. Right. That yeah. I'm very happy and fortunate to, you know, be able to have taken part in but it wasn't what i expected um it's pretty insane right yeah because i've known i've known people that have had really good luck with hollywood and i've known people that have like it's been just up and down with getting pitches through the door or just people even just voice actors i know tons of voice actors that have been that have had amazing luck and i've known people that have had like a year's worth of no luck <laughs> Yeah, vo like, voice acting is in immensely difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. And the really the best thing a voice actor can do is self-produce projects or work with their friends who are producing projects because then, you know, you get to have your creative outlet, you get to create, you know, characters, you know, it's it's amazing if you can be writing for yourself or also being a live action actor, like make sure that you're doing improv classes and going to like 
UCB and stuff like that. So you just kind of become a known person because, you know, you're no matter what your voice is, you're going to be going up against people who are in this great YouTube video somebody just saw or who they just caught Maria Bamford's act and she's amazing and they're going to use her. And yeah. so you've got to really put yourself out there there's so many the competition is so stiff in voice acting you know i don't think i've ever auditioned something and got it ever it has always been a show of mine or a show where i was writing on it and somebody knew i could act and gave me a chance um you know because i was in that writer's room i suddenly had a chance at, at auditioning um and there were people who you know respected what i brought but going through the traditional system is really difficult just because of the numbers. Again, it's just such an, a huge die roll. So I don't want to discourage anybody. I just want to let them know, you know, to try to take it, take it upon themselves to do as much as they can and rely on their friends and their community to, you know, be putting stuff out there that you generate instead of just waiting to get opportunities because uh, the, you know, it's a long wait. It can be really tough. Oh, yeah. Like, um was it like there's been people I've known that didn't hit their big break until like phew, 10 years in, like five yeah. or 10 years into their career. Like You got to love what you do and just be, you know, if you love poker, you got to just love the game. You're not in that casino to make, to, to win the pot necessarily. You're there because like you love the smell and the sound of the casino and you love to play cards and you love a good game and sometimes you win. So that's really how you have to treat it. And if you can't get in the casino, you're running a game in your hotel room. You're running your game at a friend's house, you know, like, because you love to play. That's really the attitude you have to have. Uh, you know, my attitude has always been that I'll always be creative. It's part of who I am and who I've always been. Right before Glitch Text got greenlit, I was really ready to kind of not give up, but I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to keep hammering away at this I think like my wife and I were thinking we might move somewhere we had some plans and I was like I think I'll maybe go do some teaching or there was a couple things I had planned to do for my major income and I thought well and I'll just write on the side because I know I can't not like I know that I'm obsessed and I'll have to do it and I'll find another way in or not so if you can have that attitude and sort of cover your way of life somehow um and be willing to do more than one thing i think you'll have a healthier time uh, and ironically as soon as i thought about doing that the show i was working on got greenlit which is amazing and hadn't happened to me in like 10 years so <laughs> there's some yeah. magic in the universe when when you kind of take one foot out something pulls you back in right, so yeah. you have to but you have to mean it. You have to be like, this is my last hand of poker. And then, you know what? I'm going to take a break. And then that's the one you win, of course. Oh, no. It's it's always last second. Like, oh, okay. Okay, no. That's mm, that's great. Great. Yeah. That is great. <laughs> it is great. But <laughs> it is. It, there, are, there has been times I was like, oh, of course. It's the last second <laughs> that this happens. Okay. Like, yeah, always. Always. You'll walk away from something and then it'll work out. It's just... You know, all you can count on is that you can't count on anything and that it's going to be chaos and just <laughs> try to keep a positive attitude. Hopefully surround yourself with positive people and influences. You know, that's why community is also so important. I've, I've always had so many friends to talk to when, you know, I've been down or pulling my hair out and I try to be that for other people, um, you know, because it's we all we all at some point are like, this is insane what we do. <laughs> Right, yeah. Now, I guess with Glitch Text, I mean, what was the what was the transition like now being like basically like a big showrunner for a show like that? I had seen a lot of I'd worked for a lot of showrunners and I had taken all these mental notes on like what I things like, "Oh, that's interesting. I that 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 worked really well. I should do that." And then so many notes on, "Well, I'm never doing that." <laughs> that that person just pisses everyone off and they just work us till way past when we're feeling creative and they're just running us into the ground you know so you, i had all these like theories on what would and wouldn't work but i was terrified because the show was co-created with eric robles and it seemed like you know we we hit it off so well and he was going to do mostly the art and i was going to do mostly the writing but we were both so in love with this idea that you know we and we had complete trust in one another but the world was 
it was such a world building show that was built from the ground up that I had ended up having a lot of involvement in the art and he had a lot of involvement in the writing, which was wonderful, except it really spread us thin. We had so much to do and so little time to do it. So it was very stressful. What I'm proud of is that, you know, on live action, there's a lot of collaboration with all departments to make something. And when I came into animation, I found that as a writer on other shows, you know, I never understood why we would get notes that like the script we just wrote basically like wasn't producible for a few different reasons. Mm -hmm. And we had to start all over. And I remember thinking like, well, why didn't we talk about that? Like, why are we just being told this now? Yeah. But that's how it, they do it. And it's the same with artists. Like we go change a script. The artists don't really know why they just get a list of changes they now have to do. And a lot of times it requires them to really crumple up what they just did and start over and everybody goes well that's how it is but to me i was like well, that seems messed up like i really want to go into this like being as creative as possible but i'm not afraid of limitations i want to know what's theoretically producible or not so we can address it in kind of more interesting ways than just yes and no and i also really respect artists and what they do and i want i don't want them to have to throw something out because, you know, I just wasn't thinking about what I was putting on the page. So the thing I'm proudest of with Glitch Text is that with the support of Robles and um, Ian Graham, our supervising producer, we really took down a lot of the walls between production, um, art department, and writing department. We really tried to be like one team and you know, we, Eric and I really filtered a lot of the show content, but we tried to do something that put less focus on starting over from scratch and more on starting with something strong that everybody was on board with and then refining it, you know, f from stage to stage. So we got a pretty strong season one that I'm really proud of. You know, I felt like our scripts would be really strong and then every department that would touch it would just immediately take it to the nth degree um and you know if we started at 100 percent, our final product would be like 250 percent because everyone got a chance to like double down and add something to the story rather than just trying to survive and make sense of the little piece they were given to work on so that was great what was difficult was having a bunch of writers um, and I couldn't get them all on staff I because so many of them had other jobs and they were creators in their own right. So a lot of them were freelance consultants who would only come in a couple days a week. Um, but they would do such amazing work that, you know, they did the work of a, of a, of a full-time writer. Um, but it meant that we didn't have like a fully traditional room of people there all the time. I couldn't always be there to run the room because I was being pulled into art and animatic and design meetings. Um, and it was a world that like only Eric and I really knew in our hearts what it was that we wanted it to be. And at the same time, we, half of it, we were figuring it out as we went. So this was an amazing challenge and I was terrified. And I, I just admitted to what I felt confident in and what I didn't and tried to really own the stuff that you know, I looked to other people to help me. I turned to podcasts, articles um, on show running, and I tried to like pull, you know, try different theories that I had picked up on trying to like keep everybody informed and how to work with them. But it was hard. I had a few key writers who really had an amazing voice for the show, and I would not only rely on them, but in some ways, you know, um, I would follow their cues. Like, I have a very strong. I would say the show has a voice that I feel like is my voice to some extent. It's the kind of work I love to do. But when I work with somebody like Ashley Birch and I pick up on what she's laying down, it absolutely changes how I approach these characters. And now it's not just my voice. It's like me and Ashley and the other writers all bringing something that like, um, change who I am and even my executive if, when I got to know the kind of notes I would get from her which were very good notes I would try to think ahead as to what she might say and now I was using her voice in the work um, 
and it was great, but it was all kind of falling on me to do a lot of rewrite and polish work. And I know this is a really long answer, but um, it's the first I've ever talked about it. I was under the impression that like, if I was polishing everything, that that was not a good thing. I, I thought like, I really want the writers to just, they should have the as much voice in the script as possible. And I still believe that, except it was the first season of a brand new show. And it took, it took another showrunner. It was actually Bill Freiberger, who we talked about before. Who's right, like, yeah. Dan, he's like, no matter just having the staff there to bounce ideas off of and having them, you know, give you ideas right, wrong, or indifferent, they are earning every penny and they are living up to their best potential. Only, only a showrunner like you or Robles or, you know, whatever can ultimately do a first season polish. You have to, and you can't farm that work out to someone else. You have to do it. And then when your show is out and everyone sees it, hopefully now everyone has a sense of like what that is. Like if you were to write a spec script for The Simpsons, you have a sense of what that might be. You, you, you have a sense of what a Doctor Who script might be. But nobody could tell which glitch text was while we were making season one. So he kind of cured me of that and he made me realize like, yes, I shouldn't be um, ashamed or try to avoid you know, needing to polish certain things. And that lets me actually give my staff a lot more freedom to just try things and they don't have to be perfect and they don't have to like, um, you know, get it so right on the page that I don't need to, to polish it for them. In fact, they're going to learn by, you know, process of elimination. So I learned to, I was always nice and inclusive of my staff. But I think I drove them a little crazy because I was really trying to inspire them to kind of, you know, hit certain marks that I had in mind for them. And instead, I think I should have probably been more communal about letting them be looser and then spending more time polishing with them so that they can learn as I went through, you know, we could learn together how to make the show. Because a lot of times they'd give me their best attempt, but then the script would be like, need a midnight revision that I would toil over all night and I'd be exhausted. Um, and if I had just done that like a week earlier with them, it would have been much less tense, you know? So anyway, again, a really long answer, but I will say I am, I've never been prouder of the writing than in glitch text. I love every writer who touched it. Um, and I just looking back, I, one of the things I would love to do another the reasons I'd love to do another season is because I think by the end, I was really figuring out the best way for us to all work together and come up with stories together. So it was scary to be a showrunner and I learned a lot and I'm proud of a lot that I did. And there are other things that I'm like, Oh, I want such a do over, you know, on that. I think it could be a lot less stressful because it's a very intense show. If anybody sees it, there's a ton of sci-fi and, a ton of character development for a little animated series and it did not come easy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's turned out it's turned out very well because the reception the show's gotten has been fantastic in the last like not even a whole year. It hasn't even been out for a year. Like a yeah, it came yeah, out in February. Yeah. Especially a show that I believe it we weren't really a hundred percent sure for a long time if it was coming out. I think because I remember, yeah. yeah, there was something I think like a, two years ago, a year and a half ago. I don't remember what it was, but I remember there was like this whole thing about something about like a something about like the Netflix Nickelodeon deal. Something I forget what it was. Yeah, there was a lot of uh, a lot of people were guessing because there were so many headlines concerning Nick and actually so few of them ended up affecting us directly. I mean, I don't, our show was not even really sold to Netflix as a result of that deal. We were already, uh, we had already, and I say we, but it wasn't Robles and I, it was Nick, but Nick had already done a deal for glitch text before that official announcement came out. Um, and I actually don't know if it's counted as part of that official deal or not. Only Nick knows what their actual time frame is and all that. Like, only Viacom and Netflix know. But things didn't happen in such a linear fashion that you can kind of discern from the articles. Uh, honestly, I just think for years, Nick has been looking for 
um, an online presence. They didn't really embrace YouTube. Quite the opposite. No, they were and, the, Viacom, I believe, had this whole thing. Wasn't it? There was like a big thing yeah. like 10 something years ago, I think, or something like that with Viacom, like suing yeah. YouTube or something like that for copyright. That cost them a decade of like online development and made them very resistant to all that. But at the same time, the it's undeniable that the TV industry has been changing and they could not carry on traditionally. So I think they found themselves kind of late to that party and trying to figure out what to do. And it's, you know, obviously Netflix is not only one of the biggest services out there um, for streaming, but also a great number of the Netflix executives had left um, Nickelodeon Viacom. So, you know, the executive who was the key exec on Glitch Text, who was like our go-to person, she actually became, you know, one of the d development heads at um, at Netflix Animation. And the woman who originally developed our show was Jenna Boyd, who ran was running animation at Netflix at the time as well. So we knew what, all of those people, Phil Renda. Um, so there had been some crossbreeding for a while. And I think it was just natural that Nick would start producing for, uh, for Netflix and other uh, formats. And we did develop Glitch Text for Nickelodeon television. And that meant a lot to us because we were fans of that brand going back to our childhoods. Right, but yeah. at the same time, we, we were concerned. We, we were worried like, Ugh, it's awkward to kind of premiere with a specific time slot and worry about people needing to tune in and make ratings and what would our, when what would our time slot be and would they change it i mean that stuff was making us nauseous so when we heard we were going to be on netflix we were thrilled because it's just 24 7 access in 150 countries and you know we just could not be happier that we would have an instant audience all over the world and um a lot of people felt that it was a good fit too because our show is not typical of nick and that's why we did it. We were trying to change the face of Nick a little bit. Um, and even Seema at the time, who was like still there as their head, she saw it as very much a good thing that, you know, it would be a little bit more like the kind of thing that would have been at Cartoon Network. And so unfortunately, the regimes at these networks just changed so rapidly lately. And the industry is in total upheaval it's changing by the month not by the year and so it's very hard for some companies like viacom i think to keep up um and nobody knows what's really going on at a corporate level i'll just say that when we developed this show we had so much support and it's incredible that they put so much into an original ip that wasn't a reboot or a licensed property um, and when we said we wanted to pursue like French animation studios and freelance consultant deals with writers, you know, they supported us through all that insanity. And it's why we have such a great show. I do not think we could have made Glitch Text anywhere else. So you got to take the good and the bad with, with Nick Viacom, you know, and just be grateful we had this ride at all. I mean, yeah, it's it's very noticeable because I've, having seen Glitch Text, I have not seen all of it, but I've seen a fair amount. And Glitch Text is a show where it genuinely does not feel like a Nick show to me. And that's not even a negative. Like it's 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 it's, it's like um it's like Infinity Train for Cartoon Network. It doesn't feel like a Cartoon Network show. Yeah. Like you had Robles who is like a Nickelodeon loyalist who loves cartoons and childhood stories and wanted to make something just kick ass. And then you had me, a frustrated live action writer who had one foot almost out the business at this point going, you know what? I want this show to be like Star Trek and Doctor Who and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> like, I don't care. Like, you're not going to make it anyway. So I'm just going to make this into my Ghostbusters show. And, you know, and Eric and I both kind of just went for it. And then miraculously, they were down. It was amazing. It's only the kind of show that can happen when you're almost not trying to, you know, too hard, you know. And um, it was really special. So yeah, it's an odd duck. It's a really odd duck. But I think they would tell us like, oh, we want shows that um, 
that are really from a kid perspective that have diversity and point of view that's unique. And we're really trying to compete with the video game market in a way that's genuine. And we're like, have you seen Glitch Text? (laughs) (laughs) That was a great speech. Have you watched the show we're making? (laughs) You might like it. It sounds like it checks some of these boxes. But, you know, some regimes knew everything about the show and then other regimes knew nothing about the show and and so it was very hard to be consistent it was like having a rocket ship where you know the first two stage rockets like send you on your trajectory and then suddenly these other ones you know kind of come out of nowhere and they you know they're not really aware like where's this rocket going and they just start blasting you off in crazy direction <laughs> you have to turn on the gps what what yeah <laughs> they're like what is this show and you know <laughs> to this day i don't know if some folks there have actually seen it or not um but i also know that you know when they come in and take over they they actually have a ton of other priorities and although it sounds ridiculous to us that they wouldn't know I also can't completely condemn them because I don't, I can't imagine the pressures on them to come in and fix the things that they're told by their bosses need fixing right? Uh, and how, how panicky that must be. So I don't know. Yeah. It's just a weird thing that we'll never really figure out. I guess something interesting I've been wanting to ask because of glitch tax, like, um, because I, I'd say in terms of TV, you've been very established in terms of working on more adult-themed shows, like Greg the Bunny and Robot Chicken, things like that. You've worked on Sonic Boom. What what was it like to fully transition to not be like to be a showrunner on a more, I guess, family-friendly show compared to things like Greg the Bunny or Robot Chicken? I think this is who I am and I've always been because, again, I I grew up with the Muppets, and what that meant to me, the original Muppets was very subversive in a looney tunes way it was adult in in a slightly satirical way but it had a good heart right and the muppets absolutely had an amazing heart and you know i i do think that's always been my favorite voice and the one i'm most comfortable with and most of my feature work that really no one will see because (laughs) most of it hasn't been produced but the tone of those feature scripts was also very much like dark fairy tales and grounded uh, sci-fi that was like very much family films. So they were meant to be for what they call four quadrants, you know, for for everyone from, you know, probably 10 years old and up to your grandparents, something in it for everybody, because those are the Amblin type movies I grew up on, like E.T. and, you know, um, uh, that's the Goonies. stuff I really wanted to make. Goonies, Gremlins, Ghostbusters, the three Gs of 1984 <laughs> and five. Uh, so yeah, that was my kind of wheelhouse. And I actually love that I could finally dig in and really sink my teeth into that and borrow from all the things that I had grown up loving um, and try to put them all in one place. And then the collaborators we had on that project were brought so much emotion and social responsibility um, and it was very natural to the project it was just the importance of really listening to people around me and giving them a voice and a platform and then sitting back and watching the project kind of bloom in a way I never would have been able to do on my own and and being able to watch the show now and knowing as much influence as I had on it there are still so many things in it that surprise me and kind of delight me because they came from other people. So that's the kind of stuff I really want to be doing going forward. Um, And that's the stuff I really love the most. And there are elements of that in Greg the Bunny and Warren the Ape. um, And in some of the sketches I did at Robot Chicken, although that was more just like kind of more shock humor and Mm -hmm. just really irreverent stuff. But the giraffe in quicksand was my sketch in the first season (laughs) and that is a good example of who i am it's a little sweet and sad and conceptual and grounded and ridiculous and character based you know and like that's that's my jam you know and uh what i warren the ape is a despicable character (laughs) and the show focused mostly on how horrible he was but to me uh, he was also just this like tragic little character who just wanted to be respected by a world that didn't respect him. And 
you know, and I had grown up with so many characters like that that were influences on me, including ones by Eugene Levy, who, you know, when I worked with him, I would say, like, so many of my characters are based on th things that I watched you do growing up. You always want your characters to kind of be relatable in some way. It doesn't have to be sappy. It just has to hit a nerve that's real. And we tried to do that in Glitch Text, too. So... Yeah, I really enjoyed the transition and I want to do more of it. I'm really greedy for that now. Mm. I'm actually adapting uh, with my wife, Krista Starr. We're adapting um, the book series Wings of Fire for mm. Warner Brothers animation with Ava DuVernay, who we admire tremendously. Um, and it's such a beautiful book. Like we, we, you know, read the book, we sought out the author my wife and I were like, we want to try to bring this to the screen. And miraculously, we were able to, you know, line up the right people to help us do that. And we've become so, you know, so much in love with the writer because it is a four quadrant story that's like dramatic and, and epic, but it has, and with strong social themes, but it's also really fun and sweet and has a good heart. So I'm totally down for this kind of stuff. Now, I've been hearing mixed things. I'm not 100% sure on this. Now, is Glitch Text still going, or is that up in the air right now? Well, shows like Glitch Text and, and um, Dragon Prince and, and mm. even shows like Tuca and Birdie when that was like at Netflix, like they yeah. don't really cancel shows anymore because they call it cancel culture, but I don't really know anybody who gets canceled. Nobody's, everyone's too afraid to even use that word we were put on hiatus we were paused you know our production was frozen um back in the beginning of 2019 when a new regime came to nick and we don't know all the reasons why but i assume it was like they knew we had 20 episodes that we were finishing production on and the simplest answer is that they wanted to see how those 20 did before they committed to making more um, SEMA had picked up 10 additional episodes because she had seen a full episode. We screened one for her in the Nickelodeon theater and we sat with her to watch it because we knew like whatever decision we made, we wanted it to be based not on a PowerPoint or a email, but on seeing the show. And after she saw it, she picked up 10 more episodes, which blew our minds because she knew it would keep our crew together. That like the show is not something that you can just order up again from McDonald's and get the same take great taste. Right. Yeah. You needed to like this was about the people who made it, um, and that if we don't keep that team together, we could probably, you know, approximate it. We could get a bunch of people back and and find some new people as well. But you know, it was difficult. So in 2019, the new regime, they they were not thinking in that mindset they more had an agenda that they needed to accomplish and i'm not belittling it i'm sure it was important but they felt look this we don't know what this thing is but let's see how it does and then come back to it because we have other fish to fry and i'm sure they were looking to relocate money and stuff like that so they put a pause on us and in a way it's fair to say hey look originally they ordered 20 you put them on you see how they do and then you decide from there. And that's what's happening now. I think based on audience response, Netflix and Nick can now talk to one another and decide, you know, is there a demand for more? Is that profitable to both companies? Do they want to continue working together in that way or, you know, or not? And even if not, that opens the door for other possibilities. You know, there are other services and it's so crazy right now, man. Like, even if Nick wanted to do more, somebody could, another regime could come in, you know, like <laughs> next, next week at this point, or if I, you know, all these companies are in such flux, you know, Viacom could be bought out. I have no idea. It's just, things have been so crazy in the industry. So as a creator, you just kind of hang on. And all we say to fans is, look, if you love the show, um, don't just tell us, we appreciate it, but tell them, tell Nick, tell Netflix, tweet them, email them let them know you like it um because if enough people hear that then you know if they don't make more someone else will um we would love to do more glitch text we definitely did not finish our story so we would love to find a way to do more um and even though we and our team are starting other projects that doesn't mean we also can't 
do more glitch techs. In fact, we already have those 10 episodes that SEMA approved ready for animation. So it would be very easy to do at least 10 more episodes. Uh, and that's it. It's just, yeah, it's nutty. So we're not officially canceled, but we're certainly not all sitting at Nickelodeon looking at the clock mm. either. You know, like we've, most of us have moved on. Uh, but, you know, the door's open. That's just how the industry is. We happily go back in there if they call. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've heard of, I've heard of shows that, I've always found it weird when I find shows that are technically not canceled they're like put on hiatus or put on hold it's like most of them now yeah but what's really bad is on some on live action shows sometimes a hiatus will prevent a writing staff or something from seeking other work and that's terrible because then you just have people pausing their income to well, yeah. you know but that's not the case with us yeah you're technically it's technically it's almost blacklisting in a way with with that kind of stuff because it's preventing people from getting other work at the same time yeah we really love the honesty and we always say that it was it was very harsh that our production was frozen in the way it was because it was like it wasn't just a roll-off it was like that day they were just like hey good morning everybody go home forever oh <laughs> to, to our team <laughs> not not to us but to our team because we had to finish you know the overseeing the animation and whatnot but but our team it was like drop your pencils you know the test is over God. and God. not only was that a harsh way to treat some of the most talented people you know in the in the building at that time but also um yeah it didn't give us any closure um but we all we would say though as far as the show went we're like it is a clean break to do 20 shows so that part we understood you know it was the method that was a little harsh for us but again i don't try to presume why i I try not to think of someone evil. I don't imagine they sat in the boardroom saying, you know what would really mess with the Glitch Text crew? <laughs> let's let's just slaughter them today. And let's make the creators do it. Yeah. And then they high-fived and they were like, <laughs> I, I just, I mean, it's hard now with our current administration, but I try not to believe that evil of that kind really exists. <laughs> and that it was more like, Hey, somebody do this thing with, can you guys take care of the glitch text thing? Okay, great. And then emails are sent. And then the next thing you know, that's just was the result. I think it's, it's less like a predetermined plan and, and actually the opposite. It's almost too loose of a plan where I, I don't know if everybody really thought it through how it was being handled. But all I know is, again, you, you've just, you got to be a pro, have a good sense of humor. And we told our crew, like you're our crew um well beyond this point wherever you go whatever you do you're the crew on this show and we continue to be really vocal about the involvement everyone had it is unheard of you know i've never seen the crew of a show be as vocal um after a show comes out usually you just move on to the next job but our team has been you know, from our production coordinators to our artists and our animators overseas, they've been posting fan art. They've been referring the show. They've been celebrating it, you know, well beyond their stop date of January 2019. And that is amazing to me. And we're so thankful to them. And it's because we are still, you know, very much a family. We know where they all are. We we are looking to not just get them back on our productions, but we're always looking to help them get on whatever production they want to be on in town because we just think they're amazing and we want to help them do whatever they can. They deserve it. So, you know, it's what you make of it. The industry is this really rocky uh, road. Um, and it's sometimes, you know, it's going to buckle you and throw you out the car window or whatever, but you got to just be willing to pick each other up and move on and say, all right, you know, it's, it's how we handle it that matters. Right. Yeah. And I got to say, thank you so much for doing this. It's my pleasure. I, I, It was really nice to talk about things that I haven't talked about other places, too, mm -hmm. um, and kind of reflect on a lot of these things because uh, I haven't for a while. And, you know, we're always learning and, and I'm eager to share with people. I hope they find it valuable. And, you know, I appreciate you asking to talk. It's really just you can tell I don't mind doing it. And yeah. I, I had 
I had some coffee before I got on with you. So, <laughs> is, is there um is there any advice uh, you'd want to give to people that are interested in uh, pursuing a job in the industry in some way? Um, I I do think it's important to first like self evaluate, really love what you do, and make sure that you're doing it because you know it's kind of why you were put on this planet and where you get your joy, not because you just want to, you know, hopefully make a few bucks and see your name in lights because that is so not really what it's about. But if you love the, any, the artistry on any level um, and you're a geek for it and you're an obsessive for it, then, you know, don't hold back and just make something all the time. And don't worry that it's not perfect. You're just trying to like build muscle memory and repetition and share what you do with other people that you think will be into it because those are the people who you are going to be supported by and be working with and that's really how you no matter where you're from that's how you're going to generate your own skill and your relationships when it comes to the industry you should also be a total nerd about you know subscribing to every podcast you can submitting to every you know competition or fellowship program um you know internships you know try to you know if you definitely want to be in the industry it is important to try to maybe move out to la even though you know our cost of living is not uh fantastic mm-hmm. i know a lot of people who end up living together that's another reason you need your community so that you and three friends are all sharing rent and then sharing opportunities and just get in wherever you can be an assistant be a you know um somebody who can just be in the environment that you want to learn from so that you can you know hopefully uh politely you know create paths to create opportunities for yourself eric and i would have lunch with um interns at nickelodeon every month for you know a good hour or two and we made ourselves available to anybody who wanted to come by our office for you know, a coffee and to talk and ask questions. We let people sometimes sit in on um, our various meetings, you know, and so that stuff's possible if you're around, if you're in the building. So do whatever you can to be close by. And um, my last piece of advice is that even if you want to be a writer, take an improv class. Even if you want to be a director, take a drawing class. You should know a little bit about what everybody does and have respect for all the various, you know, talents that go into the industry, because that will make you very well-rounded and you'll find that you'll, you'll use more than you think in your own work. And that's really all I got. Um, have a really good 20 dot, 20 sided die in your pocket. <laughs> Cause you're going to be rolling that thing every day <laughs> and, have, and keep a good sense of humor, you know, just keep a good sense of humor and be humble and be learning. That's that's really all, you know, all I can say. <laughs>